All right, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to be combining the material we learned in the last two lectures. So we're going to be revisiting iterative uh, methods to solve the system of equations AX equals B. And we're going to be using ideas from eigenvalues and eigenvectors to tell when our iterations, such as the Jacobi iteration, are stable. Okay, so what I'd like to do is start with a review of some highlights from the last lecture. Okay, so highlights from the last lecture. And this material uh, on eigenvalues and eigenvectors is very important, so I really um, kind of want to, to reiterate some of these points. Okay, so we had this special equation AX equals lambda X. Now this is definitely not uh, satisfied for all vectors X and all uh, values lambda. This is called our eigenvalue equation. And it's so important, it deserves a box. But it's only satisfied or it's only true for certain values lambda, which are called eigenvalues and certain vectors x, which are called eigenvectors. Okay? And the way that we find our eigenvalues is to look at the equation determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. All right, this is the characteristic equation. And we solve this equation for lambda, which gives us eigenvalues. Okay, and then once we have a set of eigenvalues lambda, we solve uh, a minus lambda i times x equals zero. We solve for x, okay? So this is step one. And this is step two. Good. And this is very important to study systems of the following form. So these are important to study equations like xk plus one equals a matrix A times xk. Okay, and this is also a very important equation. So this is the eigenvalue and eigenvector equation. Lambda are eigenvalues, x are eigenvectors. There's a two-step process. We first solve for eigenvalues, then we solve for eigenvectors. Um, and this tells us a lot about the solutions, um, or rather, the behavior of x as x is iterated by multiplying through the matrix A. So if I multiply x by A a lot of times, does x get big or small, right? The eigenvalues tell us about that. Um, so just to, to restate that in another way, what we're going to say is that iterations, uh, x k plus one equals a x k is stable if and only if all of the eigenvalues of A are inside the unit circle in the complex plane. So I'll say what that means in a minute. Uh, in the complex plane. Okay, so our eigenvalues lambda is some real value plus an imaginary value. And the length of this vector, magnitude of lambda, is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Okay, and so if I look at the set of all of the eigenvalues of A and I plot them in the complex plane, there's a unit circle, one and i. Let's try again. 
if all of my eigenvalues lambda are inside the unit circle, then iterations xk plus 1 equals a times xk will be stable. And stable means that these iterations will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as I iterate or as I multiply them by a. Okay? So this is just a recap of the last lecture. Um, but this is very, very useful for studying when our Jacobi iteration will and will not be stable. Okay? So let's just remind ourselves what the Jacobi iteration looks like. Okay? So from two lectures ago, we have a Jacobi iteration. Okay, remember we're solving the system of equations AX equals B. We know what the matrix A is, we know what the matrix, I'm sorry, the vector B is, and we're solving for X. And typically we want to use an iterative method when what? What are the, for what types of matrices A do we want to use iterative solutions? Right, so we want to use an iterative method when A is very large, too large to do something like LU decomposition, but it's mostly full of zeros. So when A is big and sparse, that's when we're going to use an iterative method. Okay, so the system of equations we worked with last time were 4x minus y plus z equals 7. 4x minus 8y plus z equals minus 21. And minus 2x plus y plus 5z equals 15, okay? So the first step in our Jacobi iteration uh, is to isolate the diagonal terms from each of these rows. So the, the first, the x in the first equation, the y in the second equation, and the z in the third equation. And we get 4x equals y plus z, sorry, y minus z plus 7. We get uh, minus 8y equals minus 4x minus z minus 21. And isolating the third variable in the third equation, we get 5z equals 2x minus y plus 15. Okay, then what we did was we divided by four in the first equation, minus eight in the second equation, and five in the third equation. So that gives us okay, x equals seven plus y minus z divided by four, y equals 21 plus 4x plus z divided by minus 8, and z equals 15 plus 2x minus y divided by 5. Okay, so these, I'm just going through how we derived the Jacobi iteration last time. And then finally, we gave the x, y, and z on the left-hand side the index k plus 1, and all of the terms on the right-half side had the index k. Okay, so this gives us a way, if we know x, y, and z at some time, we have a rule of iterating to find them at the later time. So I'm just going to write this all the way out so that we have it. Right, this equals um, 7 plus y, k minus z, k divided by 4, we have uh, y k plus 1 equals 21 plus 4 x k plus z k divided by minus 8. And we have z k plus 1 equals 15 plus 2 x k minus y k divided by 5. 
Okay, so this is just a review of uh, the material on Jacobi iteration. And when we coded this up, we found, so first of all, this is our uh, Jacobi iteration. And we found that it was stable, meaning that this x converged to the true solution to the system ax equals b, okay? And remember, we also introduced a factoring. We said A is equal to some diagonal matrix D. Let's see. We have diagonal matrix D plus everything else. D is diagonal. T is everything else. Okay. So... Writing this down in terms of D's and T's, what we're saying is, um, right, so this system of equations here is D inverse, minus D inverse T times XK. Sorry, let's write down here. Um, XK plus one, the vector X, right, so this vector X has entries X, Y, and Z. This equals minus D inverse times T times XK plus D inverse times B, okay? That is exactly the same as what we've written out in long form here, okay? So D inverse is the inverse of our diagonal entries of A, right? Four, not minus eight, five. So for example, we see this D inverse looks like divided by four, divided by minus eight, divided by five, okay? And so D inverse B is seven fourths, 21 over minus eight, 15 over five, for example. Um, and this is the general rule, so that given any A matrix, I can determine the Jacobi iteration very quickly using this formula. And last time we showed that the error, we're gonna call this epsilon K plus one, satisfies minus D inverse T times the error at iteration K. Okay, this is the error between XK and the true solution X. So what we would really, really like is for this epsilon to go to zero. We want our error to go to zero, meaning that our solution X converges to the true solution. Okay, so this is a really important general equation, and I'm going to give it a red box. Okay, this is the general Jacobi. Okay. All right, so last time we, what we did was we swapped the first and the third rows of this equation. So that shouldn't change the solution uh, for X, Y, and Z at all, but it does change what our Jacobi iteration looks like. So let's just uh, compare that again. So you can remind yourself uh, by digging up the code from two lectures ago that this actually is in fact a stable uh, Jacobi iteration. But when I swap the first and the third rows, so all I'm going to do is uh, swap the first and the third rows, and what I get is now minus 2x plus y plus 5z equals 15, 4x minus 8y plus z equals minus 21, 4x minus y plus z equals seven. Okay, so this is the exact same system of equations that we had before, except I've swapped the first and the third rows. Okay, so we go through all of these procedures. I'm not gonna write out every single step um, again, but what we get is this Jacobi iteration. Xk plus one equals minus 15 plus yk plus five zk divided by two. 
yk plus 1 equals 21 plus 4xk plus zk divided by 8. zk plus 1 equals uh, 7 minus 4xk plus yk. Okay, so this is the Jacobi iteration based on this system of equations. Okay, this is still um, minus d inverse t xk uh, plus d inverse b, but now the diagonal elements for this system are different, okay, and so are the off diagonal elements t. And if you recall, this Jacobi iteration was unstable. meaning that the uh, solution x, y, z did not converge to the true solution, and my error blows up to infinity, okay? So if we've learned something from the lecture on eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors, then what we can do is look at the stability of this equation here. What we really want is the error, epsilon, to go to zero, and that means that we want all of the eigenvalues of this matrix minus d inverse t to be inside the unit circle in the complex plane, okay? That will guarantee that this is stable. So what I wanna do is now go to the computer and we're gonna code up these two examples and we're going to look at the eigenvalues of minus d inverse t, okay? Okay. Um, so this should be pretty straightforward to code up. We already have the matrices. Okay. Good. So first I'm going to clear all of my memory. It's always a good uh, first step. And I'm going to write down my original A matrix. A1 equals four minus one, one, four minus eight, one, minus two, one, five. Okay, and what we're then going to do is we're going to say that a second A matrix, um, we're gonna define another A matrix with rows one and three swapped. But remember, this should have the same solution. Okay, so A2 equals um, the same A1, but with the third row, uh, let's see, swapped with the first row. Okay, let's just see if that actually works. Uh, I'm going to save this. Um, okay. Okay, so if I run this, I get a matrix A1, which is what I think it should be, and a matrix A2, which is the same as A1, except I've, fl I've swapped the first and the third rows. Okay. Okay, good. So now we know that the Jacobi iteration based on A1 is stable and the Jacobi iteration based on A2 is unstable, meaning it does not converge to the right solution. So let's, uh, let's get to the bottom of this by investigating the eigenvalues. Okay, so I'm going to define D1 equals the diagonal elements of A1. Okay, this is just a vector of diagonal elements of A1. Now, MATLAB's a little funny sometimes. If I say D1 equals diag of a matrix A, it's going to give me a vector of the diagonal elements, but I actually want a matrix with the diagonal elements, so I have to type in another command. I'm gonna say capital D1 equals diag of lowercase d1, and this arranges my vector into a diagonal matrix. It's a little funny, but if I look at the diag of the diag of A, that gives me a diagonal matrix, okay? This is just a quirk of MATLABs. And I wanna do the same thing for uh, A2, which is my unstable, my system with an unstable Jacobi iteration. So I just copy my code, swap out two for one, Okay, and then remember that I have the matrix T of everything else. So we say T is everything else. 
T1 equals A1 minus D1, and T2 equals A2 minus D2. So I'm just going to run this code, and you can see, right, like, let's look at A1, D1, and T1. Okay, so D1 is a matrix of the diagonal elements of A1, and T1 is a matrix with everything else. Same thing should be true with A2, uh, D2, and T2. Okay. Okay, so now the last step, right, we know that our Jacobi iteration is either going to be stable or unstable depending on the eigenvalues of D inverse times T. So what I'm going to look at is uh, look at eigenvalues of D inverse T. Okay, so the absolute value of the eigenvalue of um, so D1 backslash T1 is exactly the same as D inverse times T, right? That's what backslash does in MATLAB. Um, and remember, this was the stable, stable case of matrix A1. And we're going to look at the exact same eigenvalues for the unstable case in A2. Okay, so again, I'm going to run my code. And what I find is that the eigenvalues of D inverse T for my first equation are all nice and small, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33. Okay, so they're inside the unit circle. And if I iterate that Jacobi uh, matrix over and over and over again, my error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But if I look at D inverse T for A2, which had an unstable Jacobi iteration, I find that these eigenvalues are actually quite large. Some of them are outside the unit circle, right? 3.1 is an eigenvalue. And if I multiply it by itself over and over and over again, 3.1 times 3.1 times 3.1 gets really big really fast. And this is why the error for this Jacobi iteration diverges. Okay, so this is a really important point. I can have the same solution to a system of equations. All I do is swap the rows, and my Jacobi iteration might or might not have a different stability. Okay, and we can, of course, see that by looking at the eigenvalues of this object D inverse T. Okay, the error will go to zero if these eigenvalues are inside the unit circle and this error will blow up to infinity if these are outside the unit circle, okay? So that's kind of the main connection between eigenvalues and iterative methods. Okay, great. So now I want to introduce a new iterative method. What we just looked at was the Jacobi iteration. Now we're going to look at something called the Gauss-Seidel iteration, okay? Okay, so now we're going to look at Gauss Seidel. And we can think of it as, um, this is kind of an enhancement of the Jacobi iteration. Okay. So the way that, um, we're going to do, I'm just going to write down the Jacobi iteration on the left and the Gauss-Seidel iteration on the right so you can see exactly what the differences are. Okay, so what we have is Jacobi is, uh, we go through all of the math and we get this iteration xk plus one equals seven plus yk minus zk divided by four. We get yk plus one equals 21 plus 4xk plus zk divided by minus 8. zk plus 1 equals 15 plus 2xk minus yk divided by 5. Okay, so this is the same system of equations, the same Jacobi iteration we've seen over and over and over again. Probably getting sick of it by now. But I want to write this out so that we can compare it to the Gauss-Seidel method. Okay, so that was Jacobi. 
And Gauss-Seidel is very similar in the first line. The first line is exactly the same. Okay, divided by four. Now, this is where they differ. So Gauss and Seidel were really smart guys, and they thought to themselves, as I'm solving the system, this, this iteration, we think that xk plus one, yk plus one, zk plus one are better values than xk, yk, and zk, right? Like these values are getting closer to the true solution than xk, yk, and zk. So once I've computed xk plus one, why don't I substitute that into my next equation? So instead of using xk here, let's use xk plus one because we have it and it's better. Okay. So it's a very subtle difference, um, or a very subtle re rewording, but it actually makes a big difference. So now instead of 4xk, we have 4xk plus 1, because we know what xk plus 1 is, uh, plus zk. We don't know zk plus 1 yet, so we can't use it. And similarly, now we have a better xk plus 1 and yk plus 1, so we plug those in to our zk plus 1 equation. Okay, so in some sense what we're doing is we're forward substituting our good, uh, our better guess for xk plus 1 into the yk plus 1 equation. And then once I get that better yk plus 1, I plug that into my zk plus 1 equation, okay? So in some sense, this should, um, maybe this will converge faster, okay? So the only difference here is that uh, we are using the solution from earlier rows for the later rows. It's just another way of saying, once I get a good, uh, a better xk plus one, I use it instead of xk. Okay, now a couple of really interesting properties of Gauss-Seidel. It tends to be faster. And when I say faster, what I mean is that it converges to the true solution faster than Jacobi iteration. So if you recall from two lectures ago, I had an initial guess and I iterated it a number of times through this Jacobi iteration. And after I think 14 iterations, we had converged. Gauss-Seidel should take less iterations to converge because I'm using uh, more accurate values in the later equations. So it tends to converge more quickly. And it also tends to have different and often better stability. So I'm just going to say that the stability is different, um, often better. So this is great. We have a method that tends to be more stable more often, and it also tends to converge to the true answer faster with less iterations. And less iterations are good. Remember, we're using this uh, on a, this is essentially a test system, a three by three system of equations but we're really going to be applying this to very, very, very large systems of equations in general. And so converging with less iterations might mean the difference between a two-hour simulation and a four-hour simulation, okay? All right, um, and I just want to write this Gauss-Seidel in the same kind of matrix language uh, that we've used to define the Jacobi iteration. How does that look? Um, okay, so for Gauss-Seidel, we're going to now say A equals S plus T, okay, where where S is a lower triangular matrix. S is the lower triangular portion of A. And T is everything else. Okay, and if I look at this system of equations, I can almost see uh, where this lower triangular part is coming from. 
right? So in the Jacobi iteration, uh, we had this d inverse t, right? This divided by four, divided by minus eight, divided by five, that's the d inverse. And these terms are the t, the everything else. Well, here, because we're forward substituting all of the xk plus ones, what we have is that s xk plus one equals minus t xk plus b, right? This is the same as saying s, um, if I drop the index and added this over, it would be the same as saying ax equals b. Okay, and so now we have our Gauss-Seidel iteration we can write as x k plus one equals minus s inverse t times x k plus s inverse b. And similarly, our error epsilon k plus one is going to equal minus s inverse t times epsilon k. Okay, let's put a box around this too. So what I would recommend doing, this is a really useful exercise, is to actually write down S and T for the A matrix that we started with, right? We have um, this system of equations over here. We can write down the A matrix. And so we can write down the S and T matrix uh, corresponding to that A. And what I would really recommend doing is writing down this equation kind of in long form and convince yourself that this is how you get um, to the Gauss-Seidel iteration, okay? And again, S inverse is very easy to compute because S is a lower triangular matrix. And when we have lower triangular matrices, we can solve um, for the inverse using forward substitution, which is much faster uh, than for a general matrix inverse. Okay? Okay, great. So, so for example, if I wanted to compute S inverse T in MATLAB, I could always just say S backslash T, right? That's gonna use the fastest method available, which for a lower triangular S is going to be forward substitution. All right, so let's code this up and actually get a feel for what the Gauss-Seidel algorithm is doing, okay? All right. Um, okay. So I'm just going to copy my A matrix here and my clear all. Good, so I have an A matrix, let's just call it A. And I have my B vector is 7, minus 21, 15. Um, and let's just remind ourselves what the solution uh, to this looks like. Right, so X sol equals A backslash B. I'm just going to run this. Um, Okay, so my solution should be x equals two, y equals four, z equals three, right? That's the solution we're familiar with. I'm gonna put a semicolon to suppress the output. Okay, now I'm just gonna code up the Gauss-Seidel very similar to what I did with Jacobi, okay? In fact, I can use almost all of the same code for Jacobi, or for Gauss-Seidel that I used before. So what did I have? I had, um, a lot of this code. Okay. So I'm going to define D is um, diag of diag of A, right? That's gonna give me a matrix with the diagonal portion of A. I'm going to say S equals the lower triangular portion of A. And try L is a built-in MATLAB command that gives me the lower triangular portion of A and the strictly lower part, so it will not include the diagonal. And I say T is everything else. T is now the upper triangular plus the diagonal. So try U is the upper triangular of A plus D. Okay, so S is the lower triangular, T is the upper triangular plus the diagonal.
Okay. Sorry, I think I said that wrong. Try L actually gives you, let me write this down. Uh, I said that, that wrong. So going back to the, the board, for a matrix A, try L is going to give me this portion. This is try L, which gives me the lower triangular part plus the diagonal. And try U is going to give me the upper triangular portion plus the diagonal. So they have this overlap in the diagonal. Okay, okay so let's go back to the code. Right, so S is still uh, tri L of A. It's the lower triangular plus the diagonal portion and T should be everything else. Good, okay, so try U minus D. Okay, good, we still have the same initial guess, we still have the same tolerance, and the same error that we used for our Jacobi iteration. Um, we're going to create this matrix X, and the columns of X are going to be my various uh, iterations, right? So the first column is gonna be my guess, we're going to iterate it through this gauss seidel matrix and iterate it and iterate it and iterate it. And those are going to fill the columns of X. This is just my way of organizing data. There's lots of ways of coding this up, but I like to actually keep track of my iterations so we can plot them. Um, and I'm going to say my number of iterations is equal to one. Okay. And while my error is greater than tolerance and my iterations are less than some predefined number, I'm going to go through my Jacobi iterations. So the way this looks is S backslash B minus T times X. At my previous iteration. Okay, this is a, just another way of saying uh, XK plus one equals minus D uh, minus S inverse t times xk plus minus s uh, plus s inverse times b. Okay, so this is my uh, Jacobi iteration here. And again, every time I iterate, I wanna see if this value is converging or diverging. So I'm going to look at the error between my current iteration and the previous iteration. If I, if I could, I would compute the error between my current iteration and the true solution, but I don't know the true solution. So I'm just going to see if my iterations are converging uh, to the previous value. And that's it. So I'm gonna save this and hope it runs. Okay, we have a problem. This should be iteration, not iterations. Okay, it runs really quickly. If I look at uh, true iterations, okay, it takes nine iterations. Before, our Jacobi algorithm took 14 iterations. And now if I plot X prime, we see that very rapidly we converge uh, to the correct values, okay? So the blue, the red, and the green are my values of X, Y, and Z or some reordering thereof. Okay, so this is just to give you a flavor of how to code up the Gauss-Seidel algorithm. So the only difference between this and Jacobi is that now instead of only using the diagonal inverse times t, we're using this s inverse times t, where s is the lower triangular portion, t is the upper triangular portion, and you can convince yourself um, just do it by hand on a three by three matrix, that that's exactly what this Gauss-Seidel algorithm is, is right? Minus S inverse times T, where S is lower triangular and T is everything else. Okay, good. So I'm also going to include some codes online um, that essentially take the Jacobi iteration and the Gauss-Seidel iteration and turn them into functions because maybe all you want um, is to take an A matrix as an input and a B vector as an input, 
and you wanted to do all of its iterations behind the scenes uh, in a function and just spit out the converged x. So maybe I'll just show you what that looks like and I'll then upload it. Right, so we have a function and now all I care about is the final converged x and how many iterations it took. So those are my inputs, I'm sorry, my outputs. And that equals Jacobi of the inputs. So Jacobi is a function I've written. I'm gonna save this in a file called jacobi.m. And I can give it a matrix A, a vector B, an initial guess x naught, some tolerance, and some maximum number of iterations. And then it will spit out the converged x out and iterations. Okay, so I'm just going to upload this code so you can look at it and use it. Um, and there's a similar code for gauss Seidel. okay? Okay, great. So now um, I just wanna go back to the board for a little bit and just kind of re-solidify the connection with eigenvalues and eigenvectors because I think this is such an important point. Um, okay. Right, so we're solving AX equals B, and we have two uh, ways of doing it, okay? We have this expression, XK plus one equals minus D inverse T, XK plus D inverse B. This is the Jacobi iteration. Remember, D is a matrix of diagonal entries. T is everything else. And we have another way of solving this. We say XK plus one equals minus S inverse T, XK plus S inverse B. This is the gauss Seidel. okay? Now, note that this T is different than the T up here, right? All T just means everything else in the A matrix after I subtract either D or S. Okay, and so this gives us a really efficient way of coding these iterations. So I showed you the efficient way of coding it for uh, gauss Seidel, and we can always use it in MATLAB. Um, Right? I, we have this function Jacobi and we have a function called gauss Seidel that solves these equations. But what we're now going to look at are the eigenvalue and eigenvector properties. Okay? And remember, I said that uh, gauss Seidel tends to be faster and more stable. And it turns out that that's actually kind of a statement of the same thing. Okay. All right, so just uh, one last equation. Okay, so we know what the iterations look like for Jacobi and for gauss Seidel, and we also know what the error properties are, right? We derived the error properties so that the error epsilon k plus one equals S inverse times T. I'm gonna call this T gauss Seidel because it's different than T Jacobi. And here we have epsilon k plus one equals the diagonal matrix inverse times T Jacobi. Epsilon K. Okay? Epsilon just means uh, epsilon equals the true solution X minus X at iteration K plus one, okay? And we really hope that if we've cooked up a good iterative method, this epsilon gets smaller and smaller and so that X K plus one approaches the true solution X, right? That's the whole point of these iterative methods is that we have some rules 
some very easy to iterate rules that will um, give us closer and closer approximations to the solution. Okay, so the stability of both of these methods is determined by the eigenvalues of these two matrices. So here we're looking at the eigenvalue of S inverse T Gauss Seidel. And here we're looking for the eigenvalues of D inverse uh, T Jacobi. Okay? And for either of these methods to be stable, we require that all of the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle in the complex plane. Okay? So I'm just going to draw my unit circle again. This is one, this is uh, I. And what we're going to find, this is um, generally true. What's generally true is that the Jacobi eigenvalues are usually going to be bigger than the gauss seidel eigenvalues. So my Jacobi eigenvalues might be here, um, kind of this, there's gonna be this ring of Jacobi eigenvalues. And my, my Gauss-Seidel eigenvalues are typically going to be inside. So my Gauss-Seidel are going to be a smaller uh, set of, not a smaller set of eigenvalues, but a set of eigenvalues that are smaller. These are my Gauss-Seidel eigenvalues. Okay, and remember, we're looking at, we're iterating this method over and over and over again. So if these eigenvalues are smaller in magnitude than these eigenvalues, then this epsilon is going to get closer to zero faster, right? Let's say that these eigenvalues are no bigger than 0.1, and these eigenvalues are no bigger than 0.5. So if I iterate both methods three times, I get 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1, right? That's 0.001. And if I multiply 0.5 three times, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, well, it's bigger than 0.001, right? This number, this epsilon error gets smaller more slowly than this one. Let me just say this one more time. So the eigenvalues that are closer um, to lambda equals one. So eigenvalues that are closer to the unit circle are going to decay more slowly. Okay? And eigenvalues that are closer to zero are going to decay more, more quickly. So what we do is we call this um, the spectral radius. Okay, so the spectral radius is kind of the radius where all of the Gauss-Seidel eigenvalues are inside the spectral radius. And there's also a spectral radius for Jacobi. This red dashed line is the spectral radius inside which all of the Jacobi eigenvalues lie. So the smaller the spectral radius, the faster the convergence of the iteration. And this is just kind of a cartoon illustrating that Gauss-Seidel usually converges to the true solution with less iterations, or its error gets smaller faster because it has smaller eigenvalues. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you.